So hello and welcome to tonight's International Development Studies Lecture Series. Tonight we're delighted to have two different speakers for you. First off, we're going to hear from Amber Gladney, who's actually earned her master's degree here at the University of Montana, and also used to be the Peace Corps recruiter uh, for two years here at the University of Montana. Right now, um, well, she actually used to be a health volunteer in Mali, West Africa with the Peace Corps, mm -hmm. uh, but she has her master's of social work, and she's now the program manager of the Valor House, which is located at the Pavarello Center. Yeah. So first we'll have Amber, and then after Amber is finished, um, we'll have our second speaker <coughs> up on deck, the second speaker is Emily Eaton, who's a bachelor's candidate here at the University of Montana, focusing on both economics and political science. And um, she's gonna talk a little bit about um, some experiences in Malaysia. Her topic is Purposeful Wanderings, How to Make the Most of Your College Experience Abroad. And then following up with that, the ultimate price, human trafficking in Southeast Asia. She's going to be able to speak to us a little bit about her experiences with a, an IE3 internship at T Tanaganita in Malaysia. And it's actually one NGO that I've had the opportunity to visit um, years ago. Um, so really, I'm, I'm delighted to have both of our speakers here with us tonight. And um, Amber, I'm going to turn it over to you. And what a beautiful outfit. You should tell us a little bit about sure. your outfit. Sure, absolutely. I will. Thank you so much for having me. So my name, like she said, is Amber Gladney. Um, so Ayirakakinewa Torositeya. Uh, in Bambara, the language that I was just speaking, my name is Fatumata Traure. Uh, the garment that I'm wearing today is like a traditional women's garb for a very fancy festival. So I thought it would be fitting today to kind of present this to you, um, kind of embody the spirit of Mali, which is more is more, colorful is everything. Um, I was hoping to spend the next 40 or so minutes talking to you about my experiences in Mali. I wanted to focus on my work, I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about cultural integration, and then I wanted to talk about uh, what really sustained my ability to be in the Peace Corps for three years and what uh, helped to drive my focus moving forward. <coughs> so before we get started, uh, I'll go ahead and give you a rundown of the basics of my Peace Corps service. So I was there from 2008 to 2011 for a total of 39 months. Uh, I served for two years in a rural placement off the grid in a village called Monzambala, and then I served one year in uh, the urban capital of Bamako. Uh, Mali is located in central northwest, northwestern uh, Africa, so you probably have all heard of Timbuktu. Timbuktu is in northern Mali. Uh, Mali is a totally landlocked country, and it's really divided into two main regions with uh, very barren desert Sahara uh, in the north, and then inhabitable jungle and farmland in the south. So my placement was exclusively in the south, and many of the cultural norms that I'll be referring to are very exclusive to that region of Mali. Mali is a very diverse country, and so uh, I'll just be speaking from my own experience. Um, there are many ethnic groups, there are many different types of uh, histories and traditions that won't be reflected in what I'm talking about today, so I'll just emphasize this is one woman's experience in one community. I want to, uh, to let you know that my focus was as a health extension volunteer, uh, so that meant that my primary placement was with a clinic and later with community health workers. But as is the case with many Peace Corps placements, I had the opportunity to uh, work in other sectors. And my secondary focus was gender and development. So I'll spend a little bit of time highlighting what both of those areas of work look like and try to break those down for you. Uh, and let's see. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, I wanna let you guys know that I did have a slideshow prepared. Instead, I'm gonna go ahead and show you some photos. Uh, so uh, let me know if you have any questions along the way about those photos. Know that we'll have an opportunity to talk about them later um, and feel free to you know, get lost in them if I'm kind of trailing off too. Tea, so this is tea, highly, highly caffeinated tea. Yeah, let's see if we can do that. Yeah. What a beautiful 
headscarf time. Yeah, oh yeah, and so uh, headscarves were a very big part of what we did there. Women always had to cover their hair. So I'll tell you what, it doesn't look like there's a way to necessarily slow this down. Uh, it will repeat again. Um, and like I said, uh, I'm happy to give a little more context later as well. That kid is not smoking a cigar, is he? Um, I can't promise that. <laughs> I don't think so, though. <laughs> Uh, so I want to start off by uh, telling you a little bit about why I joined the Peace Corps. Um, and this gal here in the middle is one of my main inspirations. Uh, a very close friend of mine, Brady Smith, who was also a graduate of the University of Montana and a good old Montana girl, uh, she went to school with me uh, in our undergraduate career. Uh, while I was a junior in college, she joined the Peace Corps to become an environment volunteer and actually served in Ghana, which is just two countries away. I closely followed all of her blogs and all the emails that she sent out and was incredibly inspired by what she did. And so when I think about my reason for joining the Peace Corps, it was because I wanted adventure, I wanted uh, to see the world, I wanted to become more humble. Uh, but I also really thought that if, if Akos could do it, if uh, my good friend Brady could do it, then I could as well. Um, so I think it's really important to have mentorship to have uh, camaraderie with people that you look up to and who inspire you. Um, and for me, uh, Brady Akos uh, was my number one inspiration. And so I followed her path and ironically ended up in a very similar region to where she was at. And she was able to give me a lot of very concrete feedback about things I could do better, things that I should uh, have an open mind about, and things that I should very quickly question. So without Akos, I would not have joined the Peace Corps. I want to talk a little bit about what I expected going into the Peace Corps. Um, you all know that it's a, a few year commitment that uh, you know we live oftentimes with communities at the level that they are uh, living in. And so that meant uh, a lot of big changes that I was preparing myself for. Uh, when I went to the Peace Corps, I actually had two backpacks and a small bag. I had sold off almost all of my belongings. I had, you know, pared my clothes down to like two pairs of pants, three shirts, you know, one pair of chacos. And uh, I was ready to just have this life altering experience. And ironically, by the time I left the Peace Corps, I had an, a full house of furniture. I had more belongings that I could ever cart back. And it really helped to challenge my idea about minimizing and shifting one's life. Um, I thought that I had to give away everything to become the person that I was, when in fact uh, joining the Peace Corps taught me that sometimes it's what you build along the way, and sometimes it's what uh, the areas that you grow in and the friendships that you nourish that are the most impactful. So I thought that I was going to be you know, going for this alien, totally life-changing experience, um, and what I really got was a, a whole new family and a whole new community that made me much more rooted to my life here than I would have ever expected. So then I got to West Africa. And you know, as you can see from these photos, uh, there are many things that are very striking, many uh, visuals that you wouldn't anticipate, whether that is you know, just a very dry Saharan landscape, uh, whether that is you know, just strange, uh, like I, I had to use a latrine, I had no running water, I took a, a bath out of a bucket and learned that that one bucket of water had to be sufficient for my entire body. Um, I did things like, uh, I learned that sleep norms were not the same when I was in Mali. Uh, I'm a very like nine to five, you know, uh, I have eight hours of work, eight hours of play, eight hours of sleep. In Mali, I learned that you just kind of catnap when you can. You drink incredibly caffeinated tea at all times, and then when you get the ability to rest, you do that in little microcosms. So it was not like these big picture things that moved me about the Peace Corps. It was all those small little concrete details of my life that I had to learn how to adapt. Another one that really stood out to me was bartering. All of a sudden, I had to barter for everything, whether it was my toothpaste, my tomatoes, whether it was the clothing that I wanted to wear. And likewise, uh, I couldn't just go and you know, pick up a skirt or a new shirt. Everything had to be tailored to me. So it was a, an entirely new process that involved engaging with people in a way that I did not anticipate. So my expectations and the reality of my shock were in some ways similar, but also very, very different. 
Peace Corps is really unique in that they have a very intensive pre-service training program that I think is phenomenal. Hands down, I have not seen a parallel training experience. Um, so for me, my, my Peace Corps training was for a two-month period. I was assigned to a village with six other volunteers who were also health extension agents who would also be learning the language Bambara. We were set up with homestay families, so each of us had a, a family, a mom, dad, a few kiddos that we went home to every night. Uh, but during the day, we would get together in a small semi-classroom setting. Uh, during that time, we focused on cultural norms, things like uh, who is it appropriate to greet first? Uh, are there specific greetings that you should use in engaging with a person? Um, what should you wear? Uh, what is inappropriate and appropriate? Um, Little things like uh, you may not want to use French, even though you may be proficient in it when you immediately go into a village. You may instead want to use the local language to garner more support and more understanding of their cultural norms. So the, the Peace Corps really helped me to understand not only how to speak, literally, how to learn the language, um, how to interact with people through cultural norms, and then also vocational training. So I'll highlight that in my past experience, I had a heavy focus on harm reduction. So before I moved to Mali, I worked at a needle exchange program. I worked at a local emergency shelter and I was highly focused on managing and reducing the risks associated with addiction. And then when I went to Peace Corps, I suddenly had to transition these skills of having really hard conversations to working with mothers and young children. Uh, I'll admit to you that before I went into the Peace Corps, I was very, put off by kiddos. Um, I felt really uncomfortable. I felt like we didn't have anything in common. Um, and I also hadn't spent a lot of time around women who were pregnant. And I had to quickly uh, surround myself with a community that was almost all incredibly young children and <coughs> pregnant women. And my work was focused around sustaining their health, uh, reducing risk, and um, helping them to find everyday methods to increase their health, whether that be uh, putting peanut butter into their porridge to increase protein, washing their hands before, before they prepare a communal meal to reduce bacterial infections. Um, I had to completely immerse myself in this new training regimen um, that took these skills that in some ways seemed really alien and made them appropriate for the clinical workspace of Mali. So after two months of you know, heavy day in, day out training, the Peace Corps gives you an exam. Uh, they try to ensure that you have at least a minimal level of language proficiency. It's also important to them that you can demonstrate your cultural efficacy. Uh, and if you do not pass that, you get held back and you have to do a little more intensive training. So I was uh, very pleased to pass that with Shining Stars. Um, I went through a swear-in ceremony at the U.S. Embassy where we transitioned from trainees to official volunteers. And one thing that was really scary about this was I had been surrounded by six other volunteers at all times that after having a really hard night with my family, I could come back and share in that and, and break down what went well and what didn't. I had been assigned to a community where my closest volunteer would be three hours away and I would be the only Westerner. So I was preparing to go from this immersive sort of communal experience where I had a very good support system to just me, me and my village, making it work. But I made that commitment. I said I'm prepared to serve 24 years uh, or 24 months in the Peace Corps. <laughs> and, uh, and I made that move. So I moved to a community called Monzambala. Monzambala was an off-the-grid village of 500 people uh, that took an hour on a bicycle to get to from the main road. Monzambala was very special in that it had both a clinic and an elementary school. So infrastructure is incredibly minimal in Mali. Uh, some basic breakdowns, and this is like from their National Health Institute, would be that one in five kiddos dies under the age of five. Uh, related to things like diarrheal and malarial-based diseases. Uh, likewise, um, let's see, what's the other one? That most kiddos aren't passing the fifth or sixth grade. So there's a really heavy emphasis on ensuring that there's elementary schools available. But if anyone was to go on to a middle school or to a high school, it would probably be the eldest male. And the idea would be that he'd move to that new community and then support the family from afar. So my community was very special in that we had both that minimal elementary school and that clinic. So I was assigned to support the clinic and specifically to work alongside midwives, doctors, 
and community health workers. Before I was able to jump into my workplace, however, uh, the Peace Corps really emphasized that I had to do assessment. Um, once again, I'm, I'm gonna tout the Peace Corps a little bit in that they are incredibly efficient at getting people engaged in the on-the-ground assessment process. One thing that really frustrates me uh, now that I've had this international experience is seeing how many organizations are focused on top-down decision-making and how many organizations utilize one model that may have worked in one community or one country and they try to apply that to countries and communities across the way. So uh, in the Peace Corps, I spent my first three months in my village getting to know the community. Uh, I talked to everyone from the chief to the elders, to the doctors, to the traditional healers. I talked to the mothers, I talked to the children. Sometimes I had a specific set of questions. I may be asking about health norms, I may be asking about educational norms, but other times I was just drinking tea, uh, getting to know uh, maybe their grandmother, uh, playing with their new babies. Uh, so I had to really earn their trust and to also get a genuine assessment of what their needs were. Um, I had an idea, obviously, from coming from the outside of what might be different or what might make me uncomfortable, but I didn't fully understand from their perspective what was important. So I spent that first three months going around to every single household. Um, oftentimes people would live in a family unit of maybe an elder, two or three generations underneath them, a, a few co-wives. So in my family, you know, these were just some of the kids. We had 20, pe 20 people living in one household concession. So I went to every concession, introduced myself, spent time, asked about their needs, and then went back to the doctors and said, all right, I've spent this amount of time. I've uh, developed this list of what their needs are. Where do we go from here? I want to uh, emphasize that I could not have done my work in Mali without the friendships and the relationships that I developed um, and that I feel incredibly gifted to be in the community that I lived in. Uh, Mali has an incredible social norm of acceptance. They are extremely diverse. Uh, there's over 20 different ethnic groups. Um, Mali has been a part of many historical empires, including the Songhai Empire and uh, the Malian Empire going back over a thousand years. And in that time, they've had a lot of ethnic conflict. They've had a lot of warfare. And in the last 200 years, uh, through a number of summits and uh, coalitions, they determined that they wanted to end warfare by making agreements and alliances between their families. Those alliances allow them to take in people that would formerly be considered enemies, that uh, those alliances force you to negotiate if you ever have a conflict in a way that allows you to hear all these other people. So they, they already had this, uh, this norm of taking people in and of accepting the outsider and of finding ways to really bond and commit. So they took me in like their own. And within a few months, I really did feel like my host grandmother was my granny. I really did feel like my sisters were my sisters. They had my back. Uh, they were willing to have both the easy and the hard conversations with me. Um, they were committed to helping me grow and to also being honest about where my weaknesses were and where I had room to develop. And so, with the buy-in of my community, with the friendships that I developed, um, I was able to tackle some of the seemingly bigger challenges like adapting to life off the grid. Um, one of the things that I thought would be incredibly difficult to get used to was living without electricity. I was really delighted that within about a month of being there, I, it was totally second nature to have my, you know, my little light on my head or to um, use the moonlight to navigate my way through the village. Likewise, uh, what once seemed an insurmountable task of bathing with one bucket of water, I'd get proud of myself because I could do it with half a bucket. Um, all these little things that seemed like they would be life-changing really became normal. And so I had my family, I had my community, I had adapted to a very different way of life. So then it was just a matter of taking that comfort level and pushing it further and finding ways to give back to the community after they had given so much to me. So the primary assignment, uh, the clinic where I worked, we served 21 surrounding communities. And for each of those villages, uh, which were a maximum of 10 kilometers away, um, we had two doctors and one midwife. So I was there to sort of supplement the supports that they provided, 
but it was truly a bare, bare infrastructure. Um, you'll see, you know, some photos of kind of bare leather beds, um, you know, a few sticks that would hold up the, uh, the mosquito nets. Uh, we had a birthing table that was, you know, just a little bit of metal and a little bit of cushion. Um, there was a battery operated cooler that kept our vaccines cool. And there was also a solar panel, panel system that lit up one of the offices and the birthing room. So we were just sort of this, this little bubble of access to healthcare in the middle of an incredibly barren landscape. And while we had a number of folks that came to us, we also did a lot of outreach. Um, and I was incredibly impressed by one of the doctors in, in particular who I worked with. His name was Alu Jara. And Alu was uh, conscripted. So that means that he completed his medical degree and then made a commitment, much like I did in the Peace Corps, to serve in a foreign community for a two year period of time. So he, like me, was conscripted to live in Mali and to support their health infrastructure. And that man took his mandate so seriously. Um, I'll admit that some of the health care providers were frustrating to work alongside. Um, some of them were not as committed to the objective of serving folks who were underprivileged. Some of the doctors were very wealthy from outside communities and they were also conscripted but were less happy about it. So Alu was really my rock during my time there. He was inspired and motivated. Yes, Teresa. Where did Alu come from? Alu came from a village about three hours away. Ah, and so I think the village was Sanogo. And it was ironically where one of my friends was posted. So we would try and make some exchanges from time to time. And like we would drop things off for his wife or she would come and visit me and bring things from his family. Ah. She did eventually, and uh, his wife and kiddos uh, did eventually move to Monzambala because they decided that they wanted to live there permanently and support the community. Uh, but some of the things that Alu did that really impressed me um, were he would take our uh, community motorcycle and he would, on his off days, spend the entire day completing vaccinations on the most rural villages. He would identify who wasn't coming to us and he would go, much like I did, drink tea with the family, have meals with the family, um, try to understand what their barriers to accessing health care were and express legitimate desire to help them and find ways to cut through those barriers. So whether that was, you know, finding a motorcycle that a village could use to bring their pregnant women to us uh, when they were about to give birth, uh, whether that was finding ways to rig up a battery operated storage container for vaccines that they could distribute themselves. Um, he really thought outside of the box. And even when other healthcare providers said, what you're trying to do is impossible, he said, I'm gonna find a way. So. He was just an, a spectacular person to work alongside and he continuously inspired me. Uh, we did two major things together. Uh, we uh, completed prenatal consultations and we did infant growth monitoring. So unlike the United States where you just come to your doctor or set up an appointment as needed, they'll have one day per service. So Tuesdays were prenatal consultation days and Wednesdays were infant growth monitoring days. And we would get up at the crack of dawn uh, we would come to the clinic that was already waiting, you know, with maybe 30 or 40 women, and then we would spend that entire day just seeing one after the other. So while I was not able to do direct medical practice, I was more like his secretary and his support staff. So while he was, say, weighing the babies, I would go ahead and write down their metrics. Uh, while he was trying to develop a treatment plan, I would communicate ways to engage in that treatment. So we worked as a well-oiled machine, and after our time there, I counted and I had uh, helped him to weigh over a thousand babies, which I thought was pretty incredible. And we got to know all of these women in a way that made them feel comfortable, uh, made them feel like they could confide in someone, um, and encourage them to continuously access healthcare. Some of the main things that we were trying to fight were malnutrition. Uh, malnutrition was a major, major problem, specifically kwashiakor and marasmus. So those are um, a lack of protein intake and a very minimal caloric intake. So we would talk to them about ways that they could increase both their own caloric intake and their babies, and then ways that we could uh, find protein that they could supplement their food with. Uh, another area of focus was preventing malaria. So ensuring that women were taking malaria prophylaxis during certain parts of their pregnancy. And in addition, that they were doing things like sleeping under a mosquito net and when they had their baby, also finding nets that that baby could stay under. 
So a lot of it was really basic. Um, a lot of it was just a matter of identifying what the barriers were that were specific to that person and that household and finding creative ways to work around it. Could you tell us, for instance, how you found like peanut butter or uh -huh. mosquito net to help a household? Yeah, a lot of the times we were trying to use what was already existent because the funding was extremely minimal and it was rare that these resources would trickle down to our village. So uh, the peanut butter was a really interesting one. Um, we found that there was abundant peanut butter. We were actually in a village of peanut farmers, but there was a lot of social stigma around using that as a food supplement for kids. So what we did uh, was we started sponsoring meals during these days when people would come and visit. So women might travel from you know, a village that was 10 kilometers away and then have to wait there eight or nine hours. And we found out that a big reason that people weren't coming was because they would be hungry and they wouldn't have something to feed their kids. So we would do these enormous meal demonstrations where we'd show them the different types of peanut butters or lime for you know, vitamin C or you know, moringa to increase uh, iron intake. We would show them all these cool ways that we would add in you know, these foods into the porridge. Then we would distribute it to them you know, <laughs> for lunchtime and let them participate as well. Uh, and then sort of month after month, what started as like a kind of weird thing that the Westerner was doing you know, with her doctor, people would come to our clinic just like, yeah, have you heard about the good porridge that they have? Um, so a lot of it was, practicing directly, finding leaders who were comfortable bridging those conversations, and then creating a setting where we could do both of those things. So maybe we had the most respected woman in the village come and prepare that meal. Maybe we had you know, enough food that we could feed 60 people. So we really tried to look for what was already available and work it into their practices in a way that seemed feasible. Mosquito nets, that was an interesting one. Uh, there were many projects who would provide free mosquito nets, and oftentimes they were kind of unethical in the development of their dissemination practices. So we'd, we'd find people who would maybe like stock held like 10 or 12 you know, different mosquito nets, and we would negotiate <laughs> with them. You know, Is there a way that we could give you a nominal price so that we could redistribute those mosquito nets? Like I know that you got uh, this this bundle and you're hoping to make a profit out of, out of it like is there any way that we can work with you to give these you know uh, 11 extra mosquito nets away at half price instead of selling them at the local market and I would say Alu was really the number one facilitator there he was able to have those really kind of tricky conversations and do so in a way that made people feel comfortable he could always make people laugh so yeah it was it was always problem solving oh. yeah so this, this is the clinic itself, that would be cooking. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, gender and development and how that fits into this work. Uh, so the whole time that I was there, I was not your traditional Malian woman. Uh, although I did abide by cultural norms, there were just things that intrinsically were not the same. I was actively in the workplace. Um, I could spend time with the men and I could have professional dialogue. And that really piqued curiosity in the community. They started asking like, why, why can she do that? Why is she so comfortable doing that? And then the conversation started to get broader. They would joke about, you know, like maybe my daughters will be like you. Um, maybe, maybe they could go to school. You went to school, right? Yeah, wouldn't that be funny if my girls went to middle school? And they slowly started asking more and more questions and the jokes started becoming serious. You know, they said, actually, it seems like, you know, you have a lot of potential and I'd like to explore what the options are for my girls. So I started talking to other Peace Corps volunteers and realized that this was really common, uh, that a lot of other folks were also starting to open questions in their community about gender norms and gender roles. And uh, we decided that we would try a project, see if anyone was on board. Uh, we developed a Take Our Daughters to Work week-long event where we recruited fifth and sixth grade girls, usually five from a village along with one mentor to come to the closest regional capital. And uh, for a week, we would sponsor them to visit middle schools, visit high schools, um, to go and, uh, what would the word be? to sit with a professional mentor. So maybe they wanted to meet with a professional police woman. So we would have them shadow her for the day. Maybe they were interested in starting up their own restaurant. So they would go and work with a, a, one of the local restaurant tours. And after that time, we had them come back to their village and present on what they liked and what they thought would be interesting. 
And out of that, uh, it ended up being a wildly successful project. Um, up until Peace Corps Mali shut down, um, this project was actually expanding to nearly every region. Um, and it became normal for you know, Peace Corps volunteers to regularly kind of develop this project and set that aside. So they may say, yes, I'm an agriculture volunteer, but do a little take our daughters to work on the side. Um, one thing that was really neat that came out of that, uh, <coughs> my family was personally impacted. By that I mean that uh, we chose my elder, my grandmother, to be the mentor that went with all our young girls from the village. And she was so moved by that experience that she, uh, about two years after I left, she called me and said, you know your little sister, Tom Tom, she's getting ready to go to middle school. Um, she's not one of the elders, uh, she's not one of the oldest boys, but we saw that she was wicked smart and you showed us what it was like to have girls in an urban place and you showed us that it's safe and that it's something that can further promote our family's livelihood. So we're sending Tom to middle school. So they identified a host family for her, they found the financial means and my little sister is now pursuing higher education, which I can assure you is, is not something that they would have been open to if they hadn't had that sort of eye-opening experience. So it's not uncommon for Peace Corps volunteers to have secondary projects like that where they say, this is my primary role, but I'm here 24 hours a day for two years, so I need to find something else to fill my time. Maybe I'm gonna do that in a productive or creative way. So know that if you ever consider joining the Peace Corps, you may have that one sector that you're assigned to, but you are open to work outside of that in so many dynamic ways. For me, gender and development made sense. It was in line with my values. It was in line with my community's perspective. Uh, but there are other things that you could do. You could start up a garden. You could start up a small microfinance project. So I just highlight that as something that was really fulfilling for, for my service. And then I want to shift and talk about um, how I had a little bit of a traditional service and that I really loved Molly and I knew after a year of being there that two years was not going to be enough. Uh, I started looking for other opportunities that would allow me to advance my professional skills and also help me to continue in the realm of healthcare. So I ended up moving to the capital um, in year three and uh, the capital Bamako is this bustling, just hyper-electric, uh, modern African city that was right about three hours away from my village. I worked with a nonprofit there called Puje Muso La Damune. It's the project for the empowered woman. And in that role, I supervised 27 community health workers and their role was to go from the clinic to the household and to help identify problems early and uh, then to get them directly to services. This nonprofit had a really wonderful funder base that allowed them to provide health care to folks who couldn't otherwise. So as an example, a community health worker might go into a home and find a baby with a very high fever and other symptoms of malaria and talk to the family. The family says, yeah, we, we know that this kiddo has malaria, but we can't do anything about it. We can't afford to go to the clinic. We can't afford those medications. So then the community health worker would directly accompany them to the clinic where they could get those medications and then she would do ongoing consultations in the household afterwards to make sure that those recommendations were followed. Um, I was very proud of that work because we were able to actually drop the rate of malaria infections and in kiddos under five and once again increase that community's buy-in for accessing that health care. Something that I haven't really touched on because I feel like I could go on a wild tangent, so I'll, I'll just touch on it briefly, is um, there's a very vibrant and effective community of traditional healers in Mali. So a big part of my role was working alongside those traditional healers. Um, many Western medical providers were very focused on, you just gotta go to the clinic, you, you can only go to the clinic. Um, so a lot of the times I would work alongside the tradi traditional healers to see if there were ways that we could really meld our worlds. There are things that traditional healers are much more effective at than traditional you know, Western medicine might suggest. And so a lot of my work as a third year when I was at Project Muso was really bridging those worlds, working with the traditional healers who in some ways had been shamed by providers and finding a way to really build connection between them and those doctors so we could have more cohesive treatment of people. A traditional healer may be able to set a bone far more effectively than they could, say, in a clinical setting. So, but they may not be able to effectively treat HIV. So trying to recognize you know, what, what each of our roles could do and how we could <coughs> complement one another. So just uh, I'll take about five more minutes to wrap up what I think was really crucial to my success. Uh, first of all, 
Um, I think that without the support and the buy-in of the elders and the leaders in my community, I would have not been effective at all. Um, I really spent a lot of time trying, like I said, to, to meet people where they were at, but also to honor the work that they were doing. And I always ensured that when I was talking about my success or the success of programs that I was helping to assist, I would downplay my role. And I would always really play up the support and the, the integral role that these other folks were playing. Um, without their support, nothing would be sustainable. Um, if I was to you know, develop these incredible projects and couldn't create ways to uh, bring local leaders into that, they wouldn't exist after I left. So I, I really took time to get to know the leaders and to develop relationships with them in a way that allowed them to give me a true assessment of what their needs were. Um, likewise, I wasn't afraid to embrace the totally non-professional side of work. So whether that was late night dance parties, whether that was drinking tea until two in the morning, whether that was you know spending time with kiddos, whether that was learning to butcher different types of animals, um, to tell traditional stories, to be a part of you know uh, dance offs and parades through the village. If I didn't wholeheartedly embrace those parts of their culture my impact just it, it would have totally faltered um, i was really committed to going into the experience fully and wholly and that meant uh, never being afraid to just put myself out there uh, uh, one piece of advice that i got before i left that really stuck with me and that if you're considering traveling internationally i hope it'll stick with you too is never be afraid to be the village idiot and by that, he meant you're going to be hesitant and you're going to be afraid to put yourself out there. You're going to be afraid that you're going to say something wrong or that you're going to do something wrong. <laughs> and that might shut down your capacity for trying new things. So even if you may not be perfect at the language, try to speak it. Even if you might be afraid to talk to someone, find the culturally appropriate way to do it and, and put yourself out there. Um, so kind of that, that humility, but also that willingness to just you know, be goofy and, and try new things. That, that was really crucial. And then I want to say that you know while I was there, I really maintained some of my own passions. Um, so the clothing was a big thing. I've always been a more is more kind of person. I've always loved really co colorful and flamboyant clothing. And while I was there in Mali, I was able to just find my niche and be very comfortable uh, finding new fabrics and you know really enjoying the tailoring. So I found ways to kind of meld that personal passion with what was already existent. And that demonstrated to them that I had the respect to wear their clothing instead of wearing my you know traditional Western clothing that in many ways could have been considered offensive. Um, another example is that I love to bike. And even though I was an hour away from the main road, I would spend about 30 minutes every day just riding into the bush and kind of clearing my head. Uh, we were in this beautiful migratory bird path. So, you know, I'd try to go out and sometimes I'd see a toucan and sometimes I'd see a beautiful parrot and sometimes I'd see a bird of paradise. So I kind of preserved that space for myself to keep engaging in things that I did love and things that I was really passionate about. And yeah, so this like, yeah, my closet. Um, and that allowed me to develop new passions. Uh, one thing that I'm very proud of is that before I went to Mali, I didn't really know how to cook. Uh, I would, you know, kind of just get something out of a box or, um, you know, get pre-prepared food. And when I was in Mali uh, and starting to talk to people about healthy nutrition, I realized that I had to embody that myself. So I learned to cook from scratch. And three years after, you know, joining the Peace Corps, I could, you know, do everything from make a, a simple meal to, you know, a very complex meal for many friends. And that's something that I carry with me now and uh, that, you know, now I'm able to cook purely from my Peace Corps experience. And um, let's see. Overall, I think that when I left Mali, I realized uh, that I had a new family, that I had a new place that I consider home, and I realized that my worldview would never, ever be the same. Um, I'm still in contact with my family. I'm still making plans to return. Uh, I've been able to sort of nurture that relationship and find a few folks who are willing to keep talking to me even as my vocabulary deteriorates because I'm not using it as often. Um, so. I was able to take that opportunity and embrace it as a part of my life that didn't end when I left that country. Um, my Peace Corps experience continues now, and I hope to go back to this country and to find new ways to serve you know, long after my initial experience. So thank you guys so much for humoring me today, and uh, I would love to take any questions that y'all have.
Was that little boy holding a giant knitting needle that he was going to stick in his stomach or something? Ah, let's see, knitting needle. Um, I'm not sure. We did have a number of weapons that uh, the kiddos would freely wield, and that was something that I kind of had to get comfortable with. Um, they also were very comfortable, you know, butchering and preparing their own meat, which is something that I'd never really been familiar with. So yeah, if you see kids holding very bizarre things, that's definitely for a reason. And I saw you had a question. Perfect. You, you mentioned that you had, that Mali is no longer a Peace Corps country. Is, mm -hmm. Can you explain that briefly? Yeah. So, unfortunately, um, about a year after I left, Mali had a political coup um, that was a part of sort of a long standing. Uh, historical feud between the north and the south of Mali. Uh, so there was sort of this, this complex, multifaceted political feud um, that led the Peace Corps to determine that Mali was no longer a safe place for volunteers to stay. So the Peace Corps works in really close coordination with the U.S. embassies, uh, and they take the U.S. embassies consultations very seriously. Um, so that may mean that if the embassy says our foreign aid workers can't be here, then we say our, our Peace Corps volunteers can't be there either. So they suspended service for all volunteers. A year later, they brought back only Peace Corps response volunteers. So those are fo folks who have either already served or who have 10 years of experience in their fields. Um, and they completed one year of service. And then there was another sort of mini coup uh, that happened. So at this point, uh, the infrastructure of the Peace Corps is still in Mali. We still have staff members. We still have our training component. And they're kind of just actively waiting for the OK from the embassy to open back up. And I will say that that was really frustrating for many folks who have learned to love Mali because we were renowned in many ways for being one of the most stable countries in that region of Africa. Um, so it, it's difficult in that I want Mali to be more than that. But now I know that oftentimes if people have heard of Mali, it's because of the political coup. So, yeah. Well, I'd like to really thank um, Amber. Yeah, so thank, thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm. um, it's my pleasure. Marta, so can we give her a round of applause? Mm -hmm. Let's bring Elmi down and um, have her sure. presentation. Maybe at the very end, if there's time, we'll, we'll take some more questions. Okay, that sounds great. Do you need to plug in with this? Nope, okay. I've got it right okay. up here. Excellent. And you have your microphone on. Yeah, okay. maybe? Yeah, it's on. Cool. All right, oh. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was fascinating. So my, I'm going to talk about a different region of the world instead of Africa. It's going to be more about Southeast Asia. And I spent seven months in Malaysia from December to August, or from, yeah, so around that time. So it was last semester. I um, did sort of a different take on a study abroad. So have you guys done any study abroad in your undergrad or anything? Is it something that you'd consider doing perhaps? Okay, cool. I'll maybe talk a little bit about that since we have some interest in it. So right before I even decided to go to college, I knew that I wanted to study abroad. Um, so I was sort of looking at different programs and there are quite a number of opportunities here at the University of Montana. So I'm really happy to say that and I definitely pursue a lot of them. Um, there are some faculty-led immersion trips, so there was one that was going to Tanzania that was led by the anthropology department. So I was going to do that, and it would have been 12 of us students going over for a winter session. And instead, I opted to kind of do more of a immersion experience where you kind of go by yourself, and you have more of a host family, and I preferred that route, but I know it's not for everyone, so it's definitely something that you should consider. And also, um, I didn't really want to go to just a normal school because I thought, ah, you can be in a square box anywhere. I wanted to actually be more, you know, in the field or getting some more hands-on work experience. So that's why I found this IE3 site and it just was the perfect option for me. Um, so basically, it's a regional partnership that we have. So it's our school along with 12 other schools in the western North, Northwest. And so we'll go ahead and click on this website because I know people always talk about 
the sites, but then you never actually go on it. And it is so easy that I feel like everyone should go on it. So real quick, we'll just go to the home page, internships, find an internship. And it's amazingly easy to search for it. You can search by location, the language, you can go by your major or what sort of topic you want to focus on. So you can just pick it and scroll all the way through. Um, so I went ahead and searched by a major primarily. Um, so I'm a political science and economics, and I'm also very interested in the women's and development. So um, this just seemed like the perfect opportunity for me. Um, you can read about the description of it, as well as they are very transparent about the costs of the program. So that's really nice. Um, it looks a little bit pricey, but the University of Montana helped to really offset those costs as well. I talked with um, some advisors here. Um, Kevin Hood, he's located in the basement of the Honors College now. He used to be somewhere else, but he's now down there. And he's a really great resource to talk to, as well as um, while you're over there, you're always talking with somebody here. So you have that experience of, in case you have something bad happen, you can always have somebody, you can directly email. I had her Skype, I Skyped with her. When I first got there, I Skyped with her about every week, and then it was more like once a month, there's periodic check-ins and stuff like that. Um, so one of my main advice things to give about traveling is if you don't panic at least once, you're doing it wrong. So I had a lot of just brand new experiences and it's totally fine to feel uncomfortable. Um, I wasn't really sure what culture shock was. You know, we always talk about it in different orientation and trainings. And I kind of found that to be more being feeling offended internally, like, oh, you did something against me or something. And then I had to sort of separate from that and be like, okay, that's what culture shock is. It's not something taken against me. Um, when I was in Malaysia, for example, the, it was big in the news about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And so a lot of Malaysians who were against it were like, oh, no, 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 it's all you Americans. And so I had a couple people come up to me and sort of like almost a attack me about it a little bit. And I just had to think, no, 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 like it, it'll benefit, you know, American businesses perhaps and stuff like that. But it's not me personally. I'm not trying to take that o away from you. So um, I guess my way to combat some culture shock is just to accept, feel the the emotion, perhaps have a negative thought of, from time to time, but then always try to combat that with something positive. There are some amazing cultural differences that I am so proud to have gotten to experience and um, that kind of thing, as well as whenever you're traveling abroad. Um, it's important, just like how you were saying, that to take in before you just come in as an outsider and say, OK, let's change this. Let's modify these things. It's so important to understand the cultural context. So as an outsider, you're seeing things with fresh eyes. And I think that's what organizations and just people in general can really benefit from um, is those fresh observations. So maybe write them down. I had a journal that I wrote down some perhaps some suggestions that I would have. But I never mentioned them until like three months or four months into my internship because I wanted to wait for the time, the right time. And so that way it wasn't just like a surface level um, judgment. So the organization I got to help out with is called Tanaganita. And in Malay, that means women's force. Um, the founder, she's pictured right here. And she passed away last year. So the organization is kind of going through this sort of I guess you could say leadership change, if you will. Um, the family is still heavily involved, so she has three daughters and a husband, and two of the daughters and the husband, Uncle Joe, he's right next to me, um, he's still involved in the organization. So it's sort of transitioning from a family organization to more of a long-term um, and also I helped them move, so they were changing location physically as well as just like changing leadership style. So I felt like I got to come in at a vital time during this organization. Um, historically, they started out as an empowerment group, so they were working in plantations and in like the calculators from different factories that women were working, trying to assemble smaller items, and since then they have really um, grown into four main programs. So they have a refugee action program, 
They work with um, migrants, primarily in the form of um, like legal aid services. So for example, if a worker doesn't have their proper contract, they didn't sign a work contract, and then they might not have gotten paid for months on end. Um, they have a group of pro bono lawyers as well as um, whenever you're getting your law degree, you have to do like a three month service. It's part of before they get called to the bar. So they actually have lawyers come in and do um, volunteer work with this organization as well. So although it's only about 10 people, they have an external staff of 40 plus people that are coming in and out. And so it's just such an amazing um, organization to see what, what they're able to do in terms of legal support for migrant workers who. And then also um, what I'm gonna primarily focus this talk, the next part of this talk is on human trafficking. Um, I got to hang out a lot with, in the shelter that Tanaganita runs with women and some of their stories are super impactful and hopefully I'll have a chance to share a couple of those. Um, and then also they do some corporate social responsibility work so they'll go into different organizations and a lot of them are plantations. There's three huge plantations in Malaysia and they'll go in and try and um, create sort of like unionization or try and um, create just awareness for the workers to know like hey these are your rights and this is a good thing so um, so just to talk a little bit about um, some of their training programs that they did um, they have different just really easily accessible items for people to read and they have it translated in about six different languages because Malaysia is a country where there's just a ton of migration going on. Um, on a map it's like a, sort of a peninsular sort of location and it's there's people coming in from Thailand, from the Philippines, Myanmar, and Bangladesh, Indonesia. I mean it's just so so such a cultural hub of so I got to hang out with not only Malaysians but I got to hang out with a lot of Indonesians, a lot of Chinese people. It's just a lot of fun for me. So this um, part of the presentation actually comes from a talk that we had hosted with some college students at a place called Inti College. And so um, the director of Tanaganita and I, we got to sort of talk about human trafficking and to people who were business majors. So people who were going to be in the workforce and perhaps working with recruitment agencies too. So this is what how they defined it. And the definition actually comes from um, the US State Department, we have a trafficking in persons, it's called TIP is the acronym, and I think it started around 2000, and every year they publish a report that sort of talks about the rankings of countries. Um, so within this definition, the key word is exploitation. Um, so yeah, um, there's, I guess this identifies three different types of human trafficking and I guess I'll be the first to say that when when I see something like this it doesn't really personally hit me I say trafficked for organs forced prostitution some um, fishermen who are being trafficked I don't really have anything that I personally relate to that um, so I think really hanging out with some ladies in the shelter just really helped to solidify this for me um, whenever I first arrived, I read a couple books that the organization had suggested I read. Um, this one is called The Revolving Door, Modern Day Slavery of Refugees. And it kind of talks about how when um, refugees first come into Malaysia, Malaysia hasn't signed the UN 1951 um, convention that recognizes the status of refugees. So UNHCR is, is in the country, but <laughs> they're, they're working on things quite a bit. Um, still. So um, anyway, so they are oftentimes put into detention centers or very fearful of trying to find employment because they're, they have no rights as a worker essentially and employers recognize that. Um, and so I guess <coughs> one of the stats that it is in this book or, and that's pretty well known on a lot of different sites on human trafficking is that globally the average cost of to buy a person is 90 US dollars and um, approximately 3,200 people are sold into slavery every day so I don't really know the 
I wish I knew better what counts as uh, what categories are, of a slave it actually is, but um, yeah. So I'll go ahead and give some more personal examples because to me, like we, we can say numbers and we can say statistics, but I think more the, the personal um, stories are more meaningful to me at least. So um, this is the trafficking in persons report that the United States kind of goes by country by country every year. And to be ranked low is actually worst. So you want to be ranked at like one, meaning that you don't have as much human trafficking. And so what's super controversial is actually in 2015, Malaysia um, was upgraded to tier two in order for them to be able to sign the TPP. So it's sort of a, a controversial issue as to what does, is Malaysia truly trying to combat human trafficking or is it for a economic <laughs> trade deal? So, so um, are you implying that they, ch they made an effort just so that they could move up that rank or the U.S. moved them up? I mean, the U.S. The publishes the report, so who knows what their grounds are for measuring it, but perhaps they're economically motivated to, to do that. Um, so during my second month when I was at Tanaganita, we went to some fishing ports along the way and we talked with some fishermen and a lot of them are just the most down-to-earth people they take naps during the afternoon and so we kind of caught one guy during his nap but he was just so happy to wake up and and talk with us um, and they're kind of a high risk for HIV AIDS because sanitation wise they're usually using the they don't have proper um, this like bathroom facilities on the boat, as well as a lot of them share needles. Um, it's a population that perhaps they don't often have work contracts, which is for better or worse is what we found out because a lot of them love the, the ability to, they know the, the ships go out for seven to 10 days and then if they have enough money, they don't have to go out again for a month. Or, you know, so it's kind of like they can determine their own sort of working environment. And so, um, my organization partnered with the Malaysia AIDS Council and we were doing sort of a quantitative and qualitative data analysis. So we interviewed with them as well as we just had some survey questions that we asked some folks about, you know, what they wanted in their workforce. And, or, and we thought like, oh yeah, we should be promoting these work contracts. And we actually found out that the people wouldn't want that at all, but instead they, want, they didn't see it as being profitable for their kids. So we found that like we have to create some sort of way that if fishermen don't want their children to be doing this, we should find ways for them to go to school and stuff like that. And actually I, I talked to a guy from Myanmar and he has been banned from his country because he's a Rohingya, which there's like three main um, ethnicities in Myanmar and they have really sort of ostracized this, this one group. Muslim. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yep. So there's the Mon and the Chin, and they're kind of fighting for power right now. And the Mon are Buddhists, and the Chin are Christian. And then the Rohingyans are just the biggest hate group. So anyway, so this, this guy came over, and he's essentially, his family is still in Myanmar, so he can sometimes get on a boat, and it's about a month's journey for him to get home. And he actually, one time, hid himself in a barrel. And, you know, he had a little bit of sugar cane that he took with him and some water for a month. And he was able to go home to see his family because he like, hadn't seen them in quite some time. But he was um, HIV positive. And the Malaysian government was um, providing him with some medicine to take. So they had a couple clinics around the port cities. But at the same time, he could not go into the, the, the larger part of the city. He could only stay, he could land for a couple days and then he was kind of forced to, to stay on the sea. So in a way, would we define this as human trafficking? I mean, he is getting paid for his services, but yet he doesn't have really freedom of movement. He doesn't feel accepted in Myanmar. He's, you know, and he doesn't feel accepted in Malaysia either. And so I feel like that to me is like, okay, this is what human trafficking is. It's the fact that we, we don't have the, the key human rights that we need in order to 
like sustain our lives, like being able to move and not so feel persecuted. And citizenship, either in Myanmar or you know some sort of a more permanent status or citizenship in Malaysia or yeah. refugee status, so you can more permanently settle somewhere else. Yeah, so. and I mean a lot of these folks like. Like, what's a refugee? They, they wouldn't define themselves as a refugee. They wouldn't define themselves as a, as a person who's trafficked. They're just like, I'm just a person who's trying to make money so I can send money home to my kids. And, you know, so it's just kind of like, how do we, how do we first <laughs> talk to them about that? Um, this particular gentleman, his name's Milan, and I actually got to go back to Bangladesh with him um, to take him back home. He came over on a boat as well into Malaysia. And when we found him, we actually found him at sort of a brothel situation. One of my coworkers goes into, when people land on ports like from Myanmar, from Bangladesh, um, they usually land in specific sites. And the, the, the government, you just sort of pay off, the smugglers sort of pay off people. And so my coworker is very good friends with um, a police officer who kind of like alerts him. He's like, oh yeah, we're gonna get a good paycheck this month. And so then he like goes there. So it's every couple months. And um, this guy kind of, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, this guy kind of just hits me hard, I think, because he is like about 16 years old and he doesn't have a birthday. He doesn't know how, when he was born. And um, when, when I met him, he wasn't really in like a stable state because he had been so abused and beaten that we think that he suffered some brain damage. And um, he could speak a couple English phrases, and one of them was my kidney. And so with um, my coworker who speaks Bengali, he, sometimes he had some lucid moments, and basically he was going to be trafficked for organ, for his organs. And so um, these two, this um, article was published oh, 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 in Bangladesh, and then the other one was published in Malaysia about his lifestyle, and we could probably click on. So he had not yet lost his kidney. No. He was going to lose his kidney. Yeah, and I mean, on his thigh, too, we have a picture, and it's almost like he was branded. So, I mean, like, I wish that he, I knew more about his story, but really, it's not, I don't, it, it's, this case really gets to me, because um, we ended up taking him back to Bangladesh, and we, you know, took him back to his family, and his family hadn't seen him for two years. And when we took him back, it was almost like we were creating more of a problem for them. Um, we bought them a cell phone and gave it to the mother. And, you know, um, Ashik, he's my Bengali uh, co-worker, he knew somebody who was a psychologist in the country. So he had, you know, somebody coming to his house for three months um, when we took him back, you know. so. But still, I, I, I don't feel good about this one at all because I hope Milan's doing good. Um, yeah. His main means of employment would be probably to be a rickshaw driver. So you can rent them for about a um, dollar a day and you can make about $10 a day if in this city that he was in. So he would pay some money and, um, to, in order to rent this and then just give people rides from, from place to place. Um, so I hope he's still doing that and I haven't kept up with, with this guy too much. Um, yeah, I've been, do you guys want to watch uh, a story about one of the girls that I hung out with in the shelter? Sure. It's, it's hard to watch, but um, I think it'll be better than me talking about this particular story. Um, it's going to be about eight minutes long, so. Let's shut the lights off. Sure. And I'll call this girl uh, Ria Moni. That's what she is on Facebook, but this isn't her real name. But she is such a good friend of mine. Let's see. Yeah. And are you blessed? Everything I was thinking is a better life for my son and I.
मैं स्कूल में पढ़ती थी मेरे पापा शरीर ठीक नहीं है मुझे स्कूल पे नहीं कि जाना मुझे काम करना मुझे काम करना We have a passport act which says very clearly no one is allowed to hold your passport except yourself or your diplomatic mission concerned or the courts if there is a case. Malaysia tadi tu kan tapi saya nak pada dalam pegla angka tak bagi tu saya punya majikan juga saya bagi sekarang semua duit sampai jika sampai semua lah. Nanti ibu datang kerja nanti saya ambil perela ibu punya duit. Saya mula-mula datang suami saya dengan dua anak. Saya tahu saya dia orang dia orang banyak saya. Lelaki tu saya punya majikan tu bangga sama saya lah. Dia kahwin orang Malaysia lah. When she came to work. There were two children, and in the course of the two years, they had two more children, and that was the infants and the baby that she was taking care of. The orang cakap saya tak nak buka pembas. The orang pun nak anak tu sudah merah merah saya tak tahu kenapa, tapi saya buka saya malam malam pun saya dua kali buka. Sedang dia orang laki pegang, pas tu perempuan kasih selalu kasih tarik tuang lah. Hari panas yang baru masak. Baru dia orang masak tuang lah. Ada banyak kali dia orang. Baju koya-koya ada, ada gambar dia orang bikin video. Dia dia orang cakap sama saya lah, kalau kamu tak ada cakap, saya apa yang saya suruh tak ada cakap, lepas tu saya nanti masuk dalam minta ni, ni punya mama bapa kan milih malu lah satu kampung. Ada. Dua tiga kali ada dia orang cili blender kasih kasih badan saya lah punya semua badan bawa pun ada sini kasih gosok masa dia lepas sul lagi ada lain hari dia orang bagi saya makan cili saya tak ada makan lagi pukul dia pukul pukul saya pun makan cili muntah balik. Cakap suruh muntah makan lagi. Kalau tak ada makan, pukul-pukul. Lepas itu saya muntah pun masuk lagi sekali lah. Okay. There's a little bit more to that story, but I think you you get the the most from that. <coughs> yeah. So I mean, that's just sort of. One one person's experience as a domestic worker, and so I, I don't mean to make it sound like that's the only option. I mean Malaysia is a wonderful place, and there's wonderful people, but Tanaganita primarily saw some of the the worst cases of um, domestic abuse, um, and so on. In 2000, there was about 150,000 foreign workers, and um, so Tanaganita has really taken a strong stance on how best to combat, you know, because it's, it encompasses, you know, the gender, um, primarily their females um, who are coming to work. Um, and as well as it's just such a vulnerable population because you're not working in a professional setting, you're working in someone's home. And so there's just kind of like that don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. So there's not really a cultural norm to sort of tell on neighbors when there's a problem. So. Um, yeah, um, Malaysia, what they do whenever they um, create agreements at the policy level to for f foreign female workers to come over um, as domestic workers, they create these MOUs or memorandums of understanding. And so 
between <coughs> the Philippines and Malaysia, that's the one that Sadaganita always advocates for because they have a set minimum wage for workers. So you would talk to a, cre um, we were the employer, like it's people who are middle income because you only have to usually pay domestic workers about 100 USD and they live in your home and they do all the cooking and cleaning and stuff like that. And so the, the an employer, you or I, who's curious to have someone work for us, um, would contact a recruitment agency and the recruitment agency will, you know, has some prospective people and they'll, you know, kind of give you one that way. And what's sort of fascinating is in 2005, they created this policy that said, like, it's called the Trafficking in Persons Act. And one of the requirements is that a person has to hold on to their passport, just like Adriel in the video said. Um, but unfortunately, that's not followed through at all. So a lot of our domestic workers, they couldn't really leave because their passport is, and the whole reason why they're in the country is tied to their employer. And so there's really no lack of, no ability to, to leave a, a rough situation. And actually one time I was with a woman who was in our shelter. Did you have a question? Okay, and um, she was like about 50. And that's like the cap of how old you can be is 45 typically with a lot of the MOUs. And so it was just kind of fascinating that like she was still here and working. So she'd worked pretty much her whole life here in Malaysia. And one of her employers, like she had all kinds of scars on her back from getting beaten from a woman employer. Um, and um, we went to the house with some police officers. It was somebody in the ATIP, anti-trafficking in persons, um, th their division, as well as two um, police officers and even they were like oh yeah it's okay that the woman keeps her the passport because the woman's gonna go in a couple weeks and cancel the and so I mean it was cancel the employment contract but for now she June just has to wait and it was just it's a little bit frustrating because there are some good policies in place and I think that with the Philippines we didn't see nearly as many cases with Filipino workers because there's a set minimum wage but whereas like with Indonesia, there's none, so we we didn't um, we saw a lot of cases from Indonesia as well as from Bangladesh, um, like Riamoni is from. Um, so one Tanaganita has a campaign currently at more of the policy level, and so it's very common to hear workers being called maid. And actually, I hung out with some young lawyers who were, you know, more of the prominent people in society, I would say, and they're just a lot of fun to go shopping with, and they were around my age. But um, when I would go over to their houses, I hung out with this one guy all the time, and he would refer to his domestic worker as maid. He didn't even know her name. And so after me chewing him out a few times, he, he now calls her by her name. <laughs> but anyway, so I think just recognizing that domestic work is work, and so instead of just saying the word maid all the time, like we should really showcase that they are workers. And then another one of their policies is to advocate for one paid day off. So, um, per, week, right? per week, yeah. So, and then the third part, which I got to be really involved in this, I actually helped to write this gender and migration um, pamphlet. It's about 58 pages. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was long for me to do. <laughs> but, um, and it's all about this passing a domestic workers bill through legislation. So we're trying to get a member of parliament to advocate and stand up and present this bill in order for um, workers to create contracts between the employer and the employee. Because currently it's between the employer and the recruitment agent. And the employee basically gets no rights at all. So, yeah. I think I'll stop probably there so I can have some time for questions or I'm gonna come near to your microphone for the film. Oh sure. So one thing I was wondering, you mentioned that there was rather a high program fee to do an IE three internship. Oh. Can you talk about um, how that might give you some credits though here on campus? Because it actually that. becomes really affordable for especially out of state students, but sometimes even in state students, you can study abroad and do internships more cheaply than you could be here. So. Yeah, I'm so sorry I forgot to mention that. I'm doing IE3 a disservice for saying that. Yeah, so one of the great incentives about it is that you can, 
essentially you're paying about three thousand dollars for the program fee of three thousand four hundred fifty um, but you can get up to 12 credits for no UM cost so you just talk with the professor and um, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky but I was able to get mine approved to take a couple online classes and so then I got to I took nine credits so that's just about the same as me paying for out-of-state um, for for nine credits worth if I were to take like a summer session or something like that so it, it ended up being about comparable in price and also there's the global leadership initiative which is something that I, th I think anybody can be involved with and they gave they give really good scholarships. I think they got like, what was it, like 20 million or something crazy? I don't know, they just got a ton of money. They were on a $1 million grant and now they've got like double, triple, something crazy. So they've got lots of money that they want to spend it for students to go study abroad, so please take advantage of different opportunities like that as well. Did IE3 help you find housing? Yeah, they did. So I spoke with the main coordinator at the organization and she gave me some options. So she said I could either live in an apartment or there's some college housing sort of options that I could do. And I opted to stay with more of a host family. And I actually got to stay with um, the, the daughter of the, found, the founder of the organization. So I really got to be immersed in with Naganita stuff. I got to learn all about their history and got to learn about their personal family dynamic as well. And it was, it was so nice to have people to come home and live with and I could ask them all kinds of cultural questions as well. What's that? Well, regarding the, uh, the passport problem and how you have to the passports, this is kind of a tough question. Do you have any solutions that are in the, in the makings for that or anything, any ideas that you got or how to, how to solve that problem? Well, I was... Can you repeat the question? Sure. So the question is about passports and because the policy is such that, you know, workers don't typically hold their passports in certain employment sectors, is there any way to sort of solve that issue? Um, I would start with police enforcement. Like, that's where I would first go to because I found it incredibly frustrating where, like, the, the courts don't follow that practice very well. The police force immigration officers um, don't know and don't follow that as a policy. So somehow, um, and I think internationally there's been a, some shame. So there's been s some videos put out about um, some of the conditions in detention centers or um, some of these policies around domestic workers. Actually, Indonesia in May for a month the government came out and said we're not going to send any more female workers to Malaysia until there's more of a transparent policy. And it ended up not working because Indonesia has got a, they really need money right now so I, I don't think that they, their government is quite strong enough to stand up to <coughs> Malaysia but I, I do hope that some international awareness about some of the, the practices that are going on would would create some pressure for, for Malaysia to reform its policies. And I study stuff related to this too. Mm -hmm. You can have countries that are firmer. So Thailand is a country that I've studied. They have ended the export of female workers to the Middle East because of so many cases of rape and abuse. So they just do not send female workers legally to the Middle East. So I mean, they're really strict, and of course, it's going to cut on on the earnings that they could get from that worker. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, and I think it's so hard because Malaysia has much more money than some of the surrounding countries, and so the incentive for female workers to come over when they're quite young. Um, Ria Moni came over when she was 14, and I, I met a lot. I was hanging out with 16 and 18 year old chicos, and um, so you know, th there's this idea that wow, I can work for two years and then just go home and get married and live my normal life and everything will be fine. And so I wonder if there's, there's a way we could do more skill training um, and just maybe general empowerment because a lot of the women that I hung out with, I'm kind of a crafty person and so I was like, oh yeah, you know, we can do crafts together or we can learn some typing si software, so just stuff like that. And a lot of them, that wasn't what they wanted. They just wanted to go home and get married and feel normal again. And so 
perhaps thinking about <coughs> different employment opportunities for, for women um, so they don't get themselves into this situation. Well, what a fascinating evening. Literally, we've crossed continents and um, everything. I'm, I'm sure that both Amber and Emily would be willing to take your questions afterwards if you have more questions. I have worked with the IE3 a little bit, so besides Emily, I can answer some questions if you have any about those international internships. Um, so thank you.